Hello, good evening. Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater. So this is the home of public programs for UCLA Film and Television Archive. Um, we are the largest university-based moving image archive in the world, and we're very happy to have the Hammer, as, uh, their Billy Wilder Theater here as our home. My name is KJ Relth. I'm a film programmer with the archive, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here tonight for a screening of Penelope Spheris's Suburbia. Um, this is a really exciting night. This is also our closing night uh, of our seven-part celebration of the 10th anniversary of the American Genre Film Archive. Is everyone out there familiar with AGFA? Yeah. So they're based in Austin, Texas. They're a really incredible bastion of just weirdo cinema. So not they started as a 35 millimeter print collection, and they have since expanded to I think over. 35,000 materials, which is pretty big for how small of a space they inhabit. They've also recently acquired a 4K scanner, uh, which has allowed them to put out new restorations and preservation digital prints of some stuff that most of us have only seen on VHS in like crummy third generation versions before. So they're doing really great work, and if you don't already follow them, please follow AGFA on all social media. They also have a great newsletter. Um, I don't like newsletters, but they do a really good job, and it's full of like head exploding gifts every week. So that's that's really fun. Um, but tonight, I, d I couldn't think of a better way to end this celebration of AGFA and outsider cinema and uh, and really like countercultural art than this film we're here to see tonight, Suburbia. Um, so for those of us who haven't seen this before, this is Penelope Spheris' follow-up to The Decline of Western Civilization. Um, and we are so, so lucky to have Penelope here with us tonight. So if you will please all join me in welcoming to the stage the one and only director and UCLA alum, Ms. Penelope Spheris. <laughs> That's why he's here to take the bag. <laughs> I, what's that? That's, that's why he's here to take the bag, right? No, he's here because I've been with him for 22 years and I can't ditch him now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for being here, Penelope. Well, thank you for yeah. asking me to be here, KJ. Yeah, of course. Um, I, I When we were talking on the phone before we, uh, before we saw each other tonight, you were telling me that you recently went to go visit your vault where a lot of your prints are stored um, and that you were able to go through some of the materials that you've been storing there yeah. and you came across some paper gems uh, that I that we were hoping we could talk a little bit about. Well I when I did uh, decline the first decline in 1980 uh, we couldn't get it into theaters because the word was you couldn't have a documentary in a theater so somebody said to me, if you want to get a movie into a theater, you have to write a narrative movie. And if you want to do a movie about punk rock, then write a narrative movie about punk rock. So neither one of us can remember how we met each other. But Bert Dragon, who's 95 years old, so he has an excuse for not remembering. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I met him, and he had $250,000. He came out here. He's a furniture salesman in Cle Cleveland, came out here, wanted to make movies. Said, I got two fifty. I like your script, Suburbia. I wrote the script. He, he read it. He liked it. He goes, but I we need the other two fifty. So I went to Roger Corman. And Roger and Bert got along very, very well. Um, so they didn't know each other before. No, 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 yes, they yeah. didn't. But Roger likes anybody that has the other half of the money. <laughs> <laughs> and so... <laughs> Um, they got along very, very well. And the cool thing was, you see, this was my first narrative film, uh, Suburbia was. And um, the cool thing is, I, I, Roger really, he, it, it's true. He taught so many of us how the hell to do this, you know? Um, shooting a documentary is a whole different world than, um, than shooting a, a narrative piece. And so what he did was he gave me some notes, and my recollection of the notes were, 
was that the first thing on the list was be sure to sit in the in the director's chair as much as you can during the day because uh, the job is exhausting. And I thought, uh, yeah. yeah, but that's not what it is. I don't know where I got that from. Um, I think he said it to me. Um, but he was absolutely right. You know, you gotta, you got to sit down and chill. Um, and also, like, remind people who the hell you are on again? set. Like, just remind people, like, yeah, this is my chair. Oh, I don't do that shit. <laughs> I know. See, that's the thing about a lot of young filmmakers now. <laughs> it's like they think that directing is sitting in that magical chair, which hurts your butt, by the way, <laughs> uh, and going, cappuccino, uh, action, cut. Can I have my car? It ain't like that. It's really hard fucking work, okay? And I have to say I'm very worn out from it and burned out from it. But here's here's a couple things that Roger had to say, okay? Um and you know what? Here's the thing. To this day, these things really work, you know? And, and <laughs> um, um, work out the movement and business for the actors in advance and don't hesitate to take suggestions from the actors. Yeah. Yeah, that's such a good point. Like, to just be open to, I mean, does that mean be open to collaboration or just like to get... But to make things more natural, right? Uh, yeah, all that. And improv. And I'll have to tell you, people always say, why was Wayne's World so funny? The dolly grip, okay? The guy that was pushing the dolly was hilarious. And, <laughs> and, and he would just say stuff under his breath, and I'm like, that works. <laughs> For real. Yeah, yeah, so anyway, I'm going to ask Roger to change his notes. He should say... Uh, take suggestions from actors and dolly grips. Um, okay, with, with uh, when shooting a scene within uh, within a scene, when shooting a shot within a scene, um, particularly a close up, start a few lines before the actual piece you need. And of course, we all do that, you know, to, to slide into it. And of course. He always bitched at me about this, Roger did, because uh, I wasn't moving the camera enough. Use as much movement on the camera as possible. Use a dolly, pan, zoom, uh, occasionally a crane shot. Occasionally a crane shot. Why? Because cranes cost too much money. Um, <laughs> Justify that budget. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Roger only came out to the set on the first day and um, like halfway in the middle of the shoot. But he wasn't looking over my shoulder or anything. I was going to ask about that because it, did he kind of give you this rundown of, of things to keep in mind before you ever went on set? And then he wasn't there just like kind of, he, he right. let you do your thing. Yeah, no, yeah. he totally did. You know, he, um, this is a kind of a depressing story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Are you ready? You ready for a downer? <laughs> All right, cool. Um, before I did this movie, Suburbia, I was at film school here at UCLA, and all of us uh, were trying to do stuff in the movies, whatever we could do, and Roger was casting extras for a movie called, he already had done a movie called The Wild Angels, and he wanted to do a movie called The Naked Angels. I wasn't naked in the movie, okay? But I acted in that movie. And he called us together one day before the shoot was going to happen and, uh, you know, put us all in a room. And he had hired um, the Hells Angels. Good idea. Um, to, to, wrangle <laughs> to wrangle the bikes. Um, and we were all going to go out to the desert and shoot this, this Naked Angels movie. Okay, here's the downer part. Not all the people that came to see, you know, to, to, to be cast in the movie uh, knew how to ride a bike. So some guy got on a bike. We're all sitting in there in, in this room. Some guy got on, uh, on a bike, took it for a spin around the corner with the, with the angels, and he died. Yeah, he hit a house and he bonked, not dead. Okay. Oh, that was freaky. Roger came out to the place immediately that we were having the meeting. And um, 
and you know did all the right things and said you know this is a horrible thing but we're gonna keep going my name in the movie was Shirley and I was animals girlfriend and I rode on the back of a bike through the desert and I'm sure it's a terrible movie I don't think I've ever seen it but um, <laughs> I do remember in the pack we were riding and there was a guy in the front that went down it was uh, Michael Green something. Um, and he went down, he had long hair, and me and Bruce, who was animal, uh, and we ran over his hair as we went past him. Yeah. So should I go back to the list now and shut up? You can do whatever you want. But, but really? we, we did talk about, I, when I was looking through it earlier, I didn't see the one note that you were mentioning when we were talking on the phone, which was the the rule about what should happen every 10 minutes in a film is that on that list or you know there's certain things that Roger probably didn't want to put on paper sure but he's you know he said to me verbally um after reading the script that he liked the script uh he loved teenage exploitation movies mm -hmm. which is the way he saw suburbia mm -hmm. I didn't see it that way I see it as a profound social statement of the time. <laughs> but to him, it was a teenage explo exploitation movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he told me that, uh, it, you know, we needed to put, uh, we needed to have some sex or some violence for every 10, every 10 minutes. And my script didn't have that, my original script. Um, so you know me, I'm just trying to make it here in Hollywood and I get back <laughs> get back on that typewriter and try to ride that pony. And <laughs> it's like, okay, sex. So I have to apologize for the scene where the girl gets her clothes torn off, okay? I apologize for that. I would never do that today. I have to apologize for the scene where they kick, the, you kick ass on the guy in the garage and all that. But that was what I had to do to get the movie made, for Roger to say, okay, go ahead, we can shoot this. Yeah. So I, I should say, yeah, that it was a bit of a spoiler, but only a little one. How many here is seeing how many people here are seeing this for the very first time tonight? Okay. That's like half of the wow. people here. That's incredible. That's really exciting. Wow. Were you in prison? <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm so, can I thank you all for coming here? That's so awesome that you're coming to see it for the first time. You know, I have to say, it's a, it's a bit of history, if I don't say so for, my, you know, for myself. Yeah. It, it really is a bit of history um, in that it was, um, in, in my opinion, a, a kind of uh, dramatic documentation of the time. And if you look at, Look at me just patting myself on the back here. But if you look at the clothes and the graffiti and the cars and the attitudes and the dialogue, I mean, this is where it all came from, you know? And I'm actually pretty shocked that lately I've been asked to do, this is my fourth talk this week, I love you, but this is like a fourth talk. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> hope I'm doing okay. Uh, but, um, you know, people really want to know what happened back in those times, because not everybody had an iPhone. All your times, you know, you youngins out there, it'll all be documented. You can just go check it out and punch some, you know, clicks here and there, you know what I mean? But... <laughs> And, but back then, no, not everybody was shooting, you know? Yeah. Well, it is it is such a specific document of the L.A. punk scene, too, because there, there were simultaneous scenes kind of happening in different pockets in the U.S. There was the D.C. punk scene and, and kind of like East Coast and West Coast differences. And what I love about this film specifically is the uh, L.A. and kind of like Valley vernacular that's sprinkled throughout. Like there are certain lines that I won't say now because you'll hear them when they happen where you're just like, that is so specifically SoCal. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, so why, I'm so curious about this, if you've never seen Suburbia before, why would you come tonight? Uh, is it because it's UCLA and it's the Billy Wilder Theater and it's kind of fancy and 
Look at this guy. He's like, yep, you got it all, bitch. No. <laughs> Or is it because you're interested in the time or what? Oh, because of you, Penelope, of course. You're so sweet. I didn't even think of that part. (laughs) (laughs) And you're not in prison anymore. (laughs) Yes. They let this man out. Say it again. Oh, you want to see rock and roll? You can leave now. Okay. Actually, you know, that's cute that you mentioned that because that was 1979. Mm-hmm. Um, Suburbia was 83. Um, I really hadn't, you know, I hadn't done a, a, a dramatic uh, piece. And I went for an interview for Rock and Roll High School. For what? For, for to like, direct it, to motherfucker. Direct it. You know, Alan Arkish, who did direct Rock and Roll High School, is such a huge fan. And he Our, was, Alan Arkish. Yeah, 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 we were friends back in the day, but guess what? The bitches didn't get the gigs back then. No. So uh, I was so disappointed I couldn't do that movie. Sorry. But it was a little too happy for me. You know, I'm more Yeah, of a, it's a pretty silly movie. It's a silly movie. Yeah. It's a little too happy. But here's the thing. Suburbia is, is, is a downer. I'm going to warn you right now. Uh, you know... You, you got to get serious when you watch this movie. Uh, so I'm very happy that the, they're showing Rock and Roll High School afterwards because then you can it's leave this evening and feel really happy. Because yeah. <laughs> that's the way you should feel. <laughs> well, circling back a little bit to the writing process, I mean, what had you been working on Suburbia at the same time that you were working on D- the first decline, or no? Because the come first after? decline was 1980, and you know, I just had to kind of collect stories, and most of the stories in suburbia are true stories that I collected from my punk rock friends back then, and um, even the story. Look, there's a lot of stuff in suburbia I would never do today. You know, when you see the dogs get shot. Um, I would never do that today. My daughter rescues so many dogs, it's like she would disown me. But we didn't shoot the, we didn't really shoot them. No, don't start, okay? No animals were harmed. No animals were, oh no, there was an animal harmed. No, let me tell you what happened. Was it one of the rats? No, okay. no. Oh, the rat's a good story too, but no. <laughs> what happened? With the, let me just tell you, the, the, the dogs are trip wires, okay? So you see the dogs trip, and they try to put a gunshot over it. They look like okay, uh, but check this out. The, where the where the kids went to live, mm-hmm. there it was the kind of cockroach ridden. Okay, so I had, I this is this is a very special Penelope Ferris directorial p- tip, which <laughs> is I call it my cockroach shot because I didn't know what the fuck I was doing back then, right? And and. <laughs> And I knew that if something didn't cut together, because I was dealing with non-actors, right. if something didn't cut together, I could always cut to the cockroach. Because <laughs> the cockroach had his shit together, okay? <laughs> so I, uh, I filmed a whole bunch of stuff with these cockroaches going along the walls. And when anybody muffed their line or didn't match their hand, whatever, cut to the cockroach, you know? <laughs> However, in the script, there was a little piece where, where uh, Jack Diddley, uh, Chris Pedersen, uh, had to kill a cockroach, okay? Right, yeah. We had a cockroach wrangler, and wow. he, yeah, yeah, we did. Um, and even back in the day, you know, God bless them, they had the, the animal protectors there. If you got a goldfish or anything, you had to, have, like, have the SPCA there. Um, but anyway, so... We had to smash the cockroach. And so the cockroach wrangler, he used to carry him in a big gulp cu- a cup, a whole bunch of cockroaches. Uh, and so... <laughs> Was there, like, soda residue in the cup? Uh, like maybe. What? <laughs> that might have been what brought him in. You never know. But I told this cockroach wrangler, we gotta, today we have to smash uh, a cockroach. And he goes, you can't do that, ma'am. I'm like... It's a cockroach. Come on. <laughs> and he goes, no. The, the, I said, you, I can't kill your cockroach? No. I said, well, are they trained? No, no. But 50 bucks, you can kill a cockroach. Okay, so I killed a cockroach for 50 bucks. That's a line item in the budget, cockroach death. 
<laughs> anyway. Uh, so, um, outside have I ruined of, the night yet? What's that? Have I ruined the no, night yet? Of okay, good. Not. I wanted to ask about. Where's Alan Arkish, by the way? He couldn't make it. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> he did send his love, and he said, I think your sister worked with him? or so, My sister's gay. Worked with him. She was. Oh, I thought she said she was with no, him. No, 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 no. Oh. <laughs> she worked with him on. Oh, yeah, yeah. My sister worked with Alan Arkish on. My sister worked with everybody. Linda Sphere's an amazing uh, set decorator. But yeah, she, no, she's gay. She wouldn't have been with our Alan. Go ahead. <laughs> and I think he's, I think he might be married. Um, no, he couldn't, he couldn't make it tonight. Um, <laughs> But besides cockroach casting, I did want to talk about how you met and sort of enlisted your your cast of almost exclusively non-professional mm -hmm. actors, including Flea, yeah. who's maybe like one of the more recognizable faces on screen tonight. Right. How were these folks that you met when making Decline, or were these people who came in to actually audition, were you kind of really involved in the casting process? Well, the stories that are in there are are stories about people that I met when I did The Decline. For example, Darby Crash's mother, poor woman, Faith Baker, had to suffer the loss of two children. One was Darby and one was another child that when that child died, the friends brought him back and put, them, put him in her car. Okay, that's where that story came right, from. Right. So, you know, there was, there was a lot of stories that came from knowing the people I, I knew back then. Um, the, uh, what the hell else did you ask me? Oh, I was just asking kind of how, what the casting process was oh, like. Oh, yeah. yeah, so me and Burt Dragon, this really straight Jewish guy from um, Cleveland that made all this money making, selling furniture, <laughs> he's the coolest dude in the world, <laughs> we, uh, we would go to these uh, punk rock clubs together, and um, we would go, oh, that's an interesting person there, let's go give them a piece of paper and ask them to come and interview with us. Uh -huh. So we went to clubs and found people. And some and of them were my friends, but. Sure, the, and the clubs that you were going to, where did you actually shoot some of the club scenes that we see in this film? Do you remember? I don't know, let me think. Um, you know, that was downtown LA. They had these like uh, kind of abandoned, um, um, uh, what do you call it? Like shipping dock things, yeah. and we turned it into an arena. It was like mostly shipping sound crate. sound stages. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Whereas with the decline, you know, I shot in certain clubs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that were sort of that probably served as the inspiration for how you were setting up the clubs in in this film. Yeah. 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 I had been to way too many punk rock clubs back then. Yeah. <laughs> Are you getting tired of me yet? No. <laughs> Um, that dude with the Alan Arkish thing is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's get going. <laughs> like, um, where's Alan right now? We own. Okay, go ahead. Oh, the other location question. Um, the the really I think like kind of poetic and exclusively like very LA thing about this movie is that all of the kind of burned out and like crust punk houses that we're seeing in this movie were in eminent domain, which meant that right. it had been designated to be torn down to make room for the 105 freeway, right. mm -hmm. which at this point is, has been built, and we all know it and drive on it mm -hmm. often. But then, I mean, were you actually shooting in that area, like right. in that Southgate area? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Downey. We used to call it Downer. Downey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My dad actually lived in Downey. <laughs> oh, he, he does? He went to high school in Downey. No, I'm sorry. Not, not anymore. Okay. Yeah. Um, but what, you were still having to secure permits to do all of that, right? To shoot in there or? Okay, now the bitch is going to get me busted. <laughs> no, okay, of course. Uh, I, I actually don't remember if we got permits or not, but I do remember that when we were location scouting, I'm like, this is it, man. You know, once yeah. I saw, actually, I saw that first and then I wrote it into the script. Because you know, with with the kind of budget we were dealing with, you couldn't you couldn't make you know miles of boarded up houses. Yeah. You know, it was just a terrible thing that the government did. And I'm really glad that you tell me it's a 105 freeway now, because usually when I speak about suburbia, I tell the audience that they never, the damn government never made any houses there. They just took it away from the people. Mm -hmm. But 
now you tell me they, they actually made a freeway. I think that that's where the 105 was finally constructed. And also uh, another like kind of Hollywood story, a decade later, right before it opened, that's where Speed was shot too. Some of the freeway scenes in Speed were shot on that final section of the 105. Oh, the bus movie? Yeah, the Keanu Reeves movie. Yeah. Huh. Oh, the goddamn. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm, a, I'm ahead of my time. <laughs> You were, I mean, a decade ahead, really. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. No, it's hard to shut down a freeway. There's only, free, you know, like when you're shooting a movie, because, well, look at the freeways now. I don't know how they shoot a movie, a uh, freeway now. Yeah, unless you're Damien Chazelle and you're making Ooh. La La Land. The yeah. guy who made La La Land shut down parts of the freeway to oh, did he? shoot some of the musical dancing numbers. Okay. Yeah. Well, good for him. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even watch movies anymore. <laughs> Well, you didn't grow up as as a huge film fan, right? You were you no, were no, I did. Music scene. Oh, you did. I, I was totally a huge film fan. Uh, you know, all the time growing up, it was my only escape. That and rock and roll, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, I'm I, actually I'm just not a huge film fan now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what know? kind of stuff do you watch now? Nothing. Nothing. I watch the news and I cry. Yeah. <laughs> Don't we all? I don't know. If you don't, you're fucked up. Cause <laughs> the news. I swear to God, man. I was on the way. I got my makeup all on. I'm sitting here. I'm like, we got a few minutes. Let's watch the news. And I'm sitting there going, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like crying my makeup off right before I came over. That's all I do is cry when I watch the news. I and that's the only thing I watch. You know. I mean, I don't have any interest in movies or TV or anything like that. You know, it doesn't interest me at all. It's funny. A, 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 a sweet girl from. Uh, the AV Club interviewed me recently, and and uh, I told her I, I was a little drunk, but whatever. I I, <laughs> said, I said I said you know I don't give a shit about Hollywood anymore. I you know, I been there, did that, eh, whatever. And you know, as far as I'm concerned, they can blow me. Um, and they use it in the in the in the headline. If you haven't read this interview. It is, it is great. Anyone in this audience who hasn't read this AV Club interview should go read it immediately. It's great. Yeah, I had no idea they were going to put that in the headline. And then it went, like, to People Magazine. And, <laughs> and, and you know what? Uh, it, it's the truth. I, I really feel like I already did it. And, you know, what? Like, I, they asked me to go. This is a jive-ass agent asked me to go, oh, Go and meet somebody over at there, there, there and, and, and interview for an episodic TV. <sighs> and then I do it like five times. It's fucking insulting, man. Look what I've done in my life. And they don't hire me. They can fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really need the money anyway. I don't care. Yeah. 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 I, th I think that's a great place to end, actually. <laughs> oh. Bye. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, Penelope. Enjoy suburbia, everyone. <laughs>